All right, uh, 602, uh, my name is Jacques Livingston, and I will call to order the March Transportation Advisory Board meeting. And first up on our agenda is a roll call. David Drush. Jacques Livingston. He, here. Courtney Michelle. Here. Sandra Stewart. Present. Liz Osborne. Here. Joe Long. Here. Council Member Peck. Here. All right. Welcome all. Uh, so it looks like looks like I got off kind of easy tonight, stepping in for Neil, who is unavailable tonight. So I am chairing. Uh, it looks like a, we have one thing that we have to vote on, and it looks like the approval of last month's minutes. So take a look, and then if I can get a motion, we can proceed. I make a motion that we approve last month's minutes. Thank you, David. Uh, I'll second. So, okay, Joe is the second. Any discussion? I think you guys did good. <laughs> I'm not hearing any uh, notes or discussions. So, all right. All in favor to approve the minutes, uh, say aye or raise your hand. Yep. All right, that's unanimous and approved. All right, next up is communications from staff. Thank you, Tyler Stamey, Longmont Transportation Engineering Administrator. A couple of things for you tonight. One, last week we or last month we heard from some concerned citizens on 17th Avenue, and just want to follow up on that with a little bit of additional discussion ideas. One of the things we're looking at doing uh, westbound 17th, approaching Atwood, the curve. There's definitely a change in the the curb alignment, and so we'll be adding some striping changes westbound to our our striping work this year will be one small relatively quick thing that we can do at that location so wanted to provide that update um, you mentioned it jack a little bit earlier on but we have some some tab members whose terms are are coming up here in a couple of months so the the applications for those positions we, we really enjoyed working with all of you and would be happy to if, if you're all interested in continuing to apply or reapplying the, the Applications will open up April 1st, so keep an eye out for those. And then I think Phil has a quick update on 287 BRT. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, just really quickly, Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city. Uh, the project is moving forward for US 287 bus rapid transit uh, feasibility study. And so it looks like they're going to be heading into some public meetings coming up. Uh, pretty soon. So we'll just keep you apprised of when those meetings are uh, as they come forward. We don't have exact dates or times yet, but once they come up, we will uh, make sure that you get them so you can be involved in that discussion. We've uh, done some work kind of at the more technical level so far. And so that's been going well. I think we've uh, just had some technical comments for the group. And so they're getting those things uh, positioned and and ready for more of the outreach efforts to come. So stay tuned. We'll have more information to you uh, as it comes available. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Phil and Tyler. Appreciate that. And uh, Tyler, thanks for following up on that uh, part of 17th. It's actually in my neighborhood and every time <coughs> I drive past it now, it reminds me. So th thanks for staying on top of that. Uh, next up is any public in, uh, invited to be heard. So I haven't seen any names yet. So did we have anybody sign up for uh, public comment? I didn't have any outreach ahead of time. I think we have some call in users that maybe that I don't recognize. I, if you want to speak up. Are able to please do so. Yep. 
This is a quiet group tonight. I'm really not that imposing, am I? Or... <laughs> Maybe we could just ask the call in. Maybe we could ask the call in users to identify themselves for the sake of the meeting. That would be great. Yeah, good idea, Phil. Do we need to unmute them in some way? Great question. <laughs> they will have to unmute themselves. I'm unable to do so as host. Is that, is that star six? I believe so. If the call-in users are able to, if they, that would be wonderful if they could uh, identify themselves and just let us know who's out there. Um, hi, this is Ann Lutz, and I'm Director of Energy Strategies and Solutions. I'm here with uh, with Tim, who apparently is a host <laughs> um, for the discussion on our EV charging station. Thanks. Uh, thank you, and, and, and thank you for coming and listening in. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. All right. So next up, uh, no action items. So we'll move on to the informational items, which is uh, our presentation. So I will hand that over. I don't know if someone's got to introduce them. Um, Tyler, would that be you or Phil? Uh, good evening again, uh, members of the TAB. Wonderful to have you guys all here, and uh, we're very excited to have folks from uh, RTD here as well to basically give us their annual kind of uh, annual presentation of the update uh, to RTD and all the different things that are happening currently. Uh, obviously, a lot of impacts from uh, COVID-19 that you'll hear about tonight, but we'll just want to go through and uh, we have two members from the Board of Commissioners. I'll let the staff introduce themselves as they as they get going with their different pieces of the presentation, but I would like to introduce Lynn Geisinger to kind of start off with the the, the um, kind of the state of the, of the of the district, I guess, as it were, uh, currently in 2021. And then Eric Davidson is our new board member uh, for the for the bulk of the city of Longmont and then all the way down into Broomfield. So Lynn is more of uh, Boulder County and just touches kind of the edge up to Hover on uh, on the west side of Longmont. So I'll let her go first and give her about five minutes just to tell us uh, kind of what's going on and all the new things that are happening, exciting things that are happening at RTD. Thank you. I'm mute. Thank you, Phil. I was going to let let uh, Eric go first since he uh, since he represents Longmont, but I guess uh, I guess I'll go ahead. I actually do represent a very uh, small corner of Southwest Longmont, and as as uh, Phil said, I represent Western Boulder County, Boulder, Louisville, Superior, Lyons. Uh, and uh, the unincorporated areas up to Netherland and uh, and all the way to the Continental Divide, although there's not a lot of bus service up there. But um, thanks for having us. We've kind of been on a circuit. We've we've uh, been with the Longmont City Council and uh, Boulder, Louisville, Superior, a number of, of different places. And uh, it's really great. We Eric and I both learn a lot um, talking and listening to all of you, and, and we hope to learn more tonight. And I see a a great group of our staff with Natalie and um, Sage and Chris and others. That, uh, so I'll be listening once we're done. Um, but again, thanks for having us. Uh, things are busy at RTD. We have, um, I guess, over the last two years, I, I went on the board two years again, two months ago. And over the last two years, uh, we've had a lot of uh, a lot of change, a lot of change that needed to happen, um, as as uh, many people know, as most of you know. And a lot of what I've worked on has been around some of that good governance. I represent, I uh, chair the uh, Communications and Government Relations Committee, and in that role, you know, I've I've been working with um, our chair and others and and the board to really try to bring back RTD's brand. We kind of became known as the agency of no. And uh, I really believe we're on a good path at this point. We um, are being led now by two women. Uh, Angie Rivera-Malpietti is our chair, 
And then we brought in the first external GM CEO in many years in general manager and CEO, Deborah Johnson. And she's really doing a very good job of creating change. I've heard from, heard from several people up in Boulder, in this area, Boulder County around, that um, they're seeing a, a change in RTD's willingness to work together with them and, and uh, flexibility in some of those things. So uh, just to mention a couple of specific matters that I'm sure will be touched on otherwise tonight. Uh, a huge issue is ridership. We lost 75% of our riders when the pandemic started. And we're back up to, I think we're still down about 60%. I haven't heard the most recent. But uh, we're starting to focus a lot on how we rebuild that ridership now that people are getting vaccinated. Things are hopefully going to be opening up and people will start to um, go back to work and, and hopefully trust public transit again. Uh, I think um, some of us on the board have been pushing for a pilot to try lower fares to help bring riders back, um, start to look at how we change the eco pass and some of the other passes, the student passes, to try to bring riders back. And the a significant change is that we're hearing those things from the CEO as well, that she also agrees we need to look at, at our fares and our, our passes. She worked out a, after a number of months of not being able to work anything out with Auraria, she came in and, and worked something out to start a pilot with much lower fares there to keep them on board. And so we're hoping that we can start to use that as, as a way of looking at uh, uh, other options and other programs a big piece of that is is returning service. We're down 40% on our service. And uh, get into the issue of do you wait for ridership to come back before bringing back service? Or do you bring back service to try to entice ridership? And you may learn more about that from some of the staff. But I think it's probably a combination of both that um, we'll need to be doing in the next few months. Um, Northwest Rail is front and center right now. Uh, the Eric may talk a little bit more about this and others may as well, but the board had a study session just a few weeks ago, and we're looking at updating the design study that BNSF completed several years ago <laughs> with uh, three articles in the Boulder and Longmont papers this weekend. You may be um, fairly up to date on what that is, but the uh, CEO, Ms. Johnson, is bringing the board back a proposal it was supposed to be in 60 days, so it'll be sometime in April. And uh, the proposal will be to update and uh, the design study that BNSF completed several years ago and look at uh, peak period rail. We really, really need to get uh, cost numbers, ridership numbers that we need to get them in a very transparent way. And we need to get them it's numbers that everybody agrees on. And we need to look also at the the impacts to the cities, good and bad, and, and uh, how we deal with those. Will it be electric trains? Will it be diesel? Those will have different impacts as well. So we need to get the information. We owe it to the voters up here. And then, um, and then we have a new place to start the discussion to move forward with that. 119 is a big issue. I think you'll be hearing that from, from staff as well. Uh, it is the only capital project that's currently uh, in the funding plans for RTD with about 33 million in 2023. Um, and recently, uh, just one other thing I would mention, the board passed a new equitable TOD policy, transit oriented development, with the goal of working with developers to build at least 35% affordable housing, try to take away some of the requirements to replace all of the parking that was there before and some of those things. So I'll stop there, and um, I look forward to hearing the conversation later. If you have questions, concerns, we appreciate your feedback, and thanks so much for having us. Thanks, Lynn, and good to see you again. Yeah, it's nice to see you. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Eric, five more? Yeah, it's good to meet you all. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Phil. Thank you, Lynn, for, for teeing it up, and, and I know I know many of you, but but not all of you, so thank you for having me here. Uh, I think uh, I'll just provide a little bit more context on a few things going on in RTD. Obviously, I'm, I'm the newbie here, sworn in on January 5th, although it, it seems like it was uh, quite some time ago at this point. 
Uh, as, as Lynn mentioned, we have a lot going on, um, recovering from a pandemic, not the, not the least of those. Um, I would just echo, you know, something that, that Lynn highlighted. I, I give a lot of credit to our board uh, before me in uh, making a difficult change, but an important one in our CEO and general manager. Uh, I have had a wonderful experience getting to know Deborah Johnson as our CEO and GM. Um, she's a tough leader. She's a demanding one, but she is detail oriented. Um, she's an operator. Uh, she's experienced. She knows her way around and she's a collaborator. And from being outside, um, you know, that was one thing I felt needed to change in RTD. And now being inside, I'm, I'm delighted to be a part of that change. Um, Ms. Johnson has actually spent some time getting into the weeds on issues. I've received calls from constituents that she's personally gotten involved in. Uh, we've received uh, information from cities that, and uh, problems with IGAs that she's gotten involved in. So I think we're in a new time of collaboration. Uh, there's a lot to do, but I, I feel good about some of the, the adjustments that we've made. Um, obviously, as, as Lynn mentioned, Northwest Rail is a biggie. For those of us that are up here in District I, particularly in, in Longmont. And uh, we did have a, a good study session uh, last month on the 9th. It was thorough. We got caught up on some of the numbers and some of the history. And as Lynn mentioned, what comes next now is, is a proposal for how we proceed. In 2019, because it was looking like we couldn't do our full service for Northwest Rail, we, we finally came up with this idea. And my predecessor was a major part of that, uh, Director Lubau, uh, looking at a peak service plan. And you know, presumably we'll come back from COVID and would be looking at commuter patterns returning. The number that was thrown out was a conservative estimate between 710 and $800 million. And it's conservative because there's a lot of things we don't know. Half of that cost is BNSF cost, uh, which is, is we have to go through some of the design study work to have a really better understanding of that. There's also things like, you know, do we do electric, do we do diesel, as Lynn mentioned, and we don't have the same economies of scale buying rail cars if we are doing a peak service. So there's a lot of big questions of big things we don't know the answers to. So I'm hopeful that we can at least tackle those big ones to get a better understanding of what the, the cost would look like. And I think there's a lot to talk about. And as Lynn mentioned, I think we need to do everything in a transparent way. Uh, ridership numbers have been a question that come up to me all the time. Uh, so we need to tackle those and, and get those get those updated. Um, I would just say, you know, I think as, as Lynn said, we have some good things going on. ETOD was a really exciting one. I'll also just highlight we have uh, an app to peer review happening right now. Um, that is uh, the, the folks that are looking at RTD and giving us a good review. Um, it's, it's a good cast of characters. We have a lot of experience. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the results of that. Um, and uh, a lot of good things going on. I, the other thing I would just state, you know, since Northwest Rail, we, we had three articles, I think, over the weekend. But one thing I would ask for and encourage everybody, we need to channel a lot of our energy into any partnership opportunities. Um, right now, we've got a new White House. Um, we have Amtrak looking at the corridor. Talk is cheap. Um, there's a lot of long shots in this. But I know there are a lot of us and there's a lot of energy. I can tell you that from the emails and the phone calls just over the last couple of weeks. So I'd love to see us all work together and, and uh, go uh, go after our federal delegates and see if we can work together and uh, pull something off like bring Amtrak uh, into the corridor. So anyway, great to be here. I look forward to listening in on the rest of the conversation. I'll, I'll hand it off to our, our, our staff members that have some some good updates as I understand for this evening. Thanks. Great. Yeah, what we'll try to do is we'll try to hold questions to the end, but I've got uh, the RTD uh, presentation, so I can certainly share that if, if RTD would like that. Does that work for you, Natalie and Manas? Yeah, that works. Uh, thank you. For okay. Great. Can you see that? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Go ahead, Natalie. Uh, good evening. Everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Right, do you. Do you want staff to introduce themselves quickly? Yes, please. If you could just introduce yourself as you have your uh, your different topic, that would be wonderful. Okay. Wait. Well, then we will do that as we go through the presentation. And Manas can go ahead and go through the slide. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Mana Subaraman. I'm the service planner scheduler one at RTD Service Development North team. Uh, and today I'm here with my colleagues, uh, Natalie, Sage, Chris, and Aaron to present an update on the local, regional, flex ride, and long range planning services in the city of Longmont. Uh, next step slide, please. I'm, um, I'm sorry to interrupt and Phil, somehow I do not see your screen. All I see is viewing green wall screen, but nothing else. I have a blank. Is that a setting on my end? Is everybody else able to see the screen? I'm I able to. to. I'm able to see your screen, Phil. Uh-oh, Natalie, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, I'll go on to my Citrix and we'll move along. <laughs> sorry about that. Right. This is the RTD services uh, slide. Um, so here we, the, the table here presents the um, data on fixed route, lo, fixed uh, local and regional route services in Longmont um, in both the pre-COVID scenario and the current COVID scenario. Um, in the current scenario, the routes J and LX were suspended um, and the uh, frequency and service hours were, were reduced. Um, most of these uh, routes are operating at a one hour frequency with the exception of the LD, which is operating at a two hour frequency. Um, and we also cal calculated the operating costs for these routes. Uh, these co costs were um, calculated using the in-service hours for these routes, as well as a uh, cost per hour that was determined by RTD. The latest on that is um, $100 per hour for local routes operating in Longmont and $120 uh, per hour for regional routes operating in Longmont. Um, if you look down below, you'll see that um, uh, you'll see the total operating costs for in both the current scenario and the pre-COVID scenario. Um, you'll notice that we are currently operating at 30% of pre-pandemic service costs. Um, so essentially, we're operating at 30% of the cost while providing 60% of pre-pandemic service levels. Um, next slide, please. Here we have the uh, ridership data for um, all these routes between the years 2014 and 2020. Um, we use the August run board data for all these years, except for 2020, where we use the September run board data. The reason we picked the August run board is because this is a run board that typically sees steady ridership as well as less holidays compared to the other run boards. So we thought it'd be a pretty accurate representation of the ridership that these routes are getting. Um, and, in and in 2020, the August run board was moved to September, which is why we're using that data for 2020. Um, and I also want to note that the route L was split into the routes LD and LX in August 2017, um, which is why you're not seeing any ridership data for the L past 2017 there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Could you go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. Um, the A quick summary on the ridership. Essentially, all these routes were seeing steadily growing rider, ridership from 2014 to 2019. And then in 2020, when the pandemic hit, we had drastic decrease in ridership. Um, and I will uh, explain the trends in ridership um, in the next couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have the ridership data for the local routes or the 300s. Um, so I just want to know that in 2015, um, the uh, Longmont implemented the free fare program or the free the fare buy up program, um, which essentially provided free uh, free fare on all the local routes. So we saw a uh, increase in ridership around 2015 and 2016, which was steadily rising. Um, and then we we did notice a uh, decrease in ridership in 2018, which was recouped in 2019, but uh, we were we haven't identified a cost for the uh, for this dip in ridership yet. Um, and then in 2020, uh, because of the pandemic, we had a drastic decrease to be specific around 60%. Um, and this number matches what we are seeing across the entire system. Um, the RTD system, uh, most of the routes experienced a 60% decrease in ridership. Um, next, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and here we have the ridership data for all the regional routes. Um, 
We noticed a dip in, uh, slight dip in ridership in 2018, which was recouped in 2019. This has been attributed to the uh, route L being split into the routes LD and LX. Um, and after about a year of adjustment period, we recouped that ridership and it was steadily growing. Um, and then in 2020, because of the pandemic, we again saw the 60% decrease in ridership, which once again matches what we were seeing across the entire system. Uh, next slide, please. So here we have the data on the flex ride services in Longmont. Uh, the table here presents the uh, operating hours as well as the number of operating vehicles um, for flex ride services. Um, unlike the fixed route services, flex ride is currently operating at 25% of its pre-pandemic service levels. And so you can see this kind of reflected in the decrease in service levels during the pandemic as well as the decrease in operating vehicles. Next slide, please. Um, and here we have the um, average weekday boardings data for FlexRide. Um, in 2015, we saw a decrease in boardings, and this is attributed to the uh, implementation of the Fair Buy Up program. Uh, we still saw a lot of the ridership move to the um, 300s, uh, specifically about 324. That's all a lot of um, boardings, um, and which is why we were seeing a decrease in ridership in um, FlexRide in 2015 and 2016. Um, and then in 2020, because of the pandemic, we saw that stark decrease in ridership again. Um, if you see, look at the PAN 2020 run board, we saw that the 60% decrease, which matches what we were seeing across the entire system. But I do want to note that in the subsequent run boards, we're seeing um, a slow but you know a steady uh, increase in ridership. Um, and we're hoping that this trend continues on into the future run boards. Um, and from here, I will hand over the presentation to my colleague, Natalie. Yes, good evening, everyone. And again, thanks for having us. Um, since I can't see Phil's screen, I will have to kind of go back and forth um, onto my laptop to go through the, I think I have three slides. So please bear with me for uh, a minute. <laughs> I guess if you have the first slide up, Phil, then. Um, yeah, it says know. making adjustments to the local network. Okay. All righty. That's it. All right. <laughs> so, um, and again, just real quick, my name is Natalie Handlos. I'm the lead or senior service planner for North Team. Um, my colleagues are Mana Subaraman. Um, she just joined us in September, and we're very happy to have her. We have Sage Thornburg on with us as well. He's been service planner uh, with us for a little over two years now. His anniversary, second anniversary was uh, March 4th. Um, we also have Chris Quinn from planning, and then we have Aaron Vallejos, who took over basically for Brian Matthews, which you, I think you all will probably remember um, for our special services. Um, and she uh, pretty much took over um, indictment by fire and she's been doing a fantastic job. You get to check in with her a little later um, in regards to FlexRide as well, if you'd like. So for um, update on the, the local network, the, those who were here uh, last year, you saw this presentation um, as well. We went ahead and completed the State Highway 119 BRT study in 2019. And again, Chris will also um, give a little bit more information as to where we're at with 119 at this point. The study included a um, local bus network plan for Longmont specifically. It has a wonderful long name, as you can see on the slide. Um, we made sure that uh, we, we did a, a very extensive uh, approach. So we hired an external consultant, um, TMD. We coordinated pretty heavily with City of Longmont staff, as Phil can probably attest to. Um, we included it in the final State Highway 119 BRT project document so that it becomes part of the overall 119 BRT plan. Um, and we set it up so that it would be phased as uh, route changes become warranted. And um, those potential adjustments, we could, which could become warranted, depending on how things change due to development, et cetera, et cetera, could be routing, service level, service bans, or stop locations. Next slide, please. And I, I hope, just tell me when it's there. <laughs> so um, you've got the it's maps. It's there. Okay, got the maps. On the left, Two you maps. <laughs> on the left, you have the current network. On the right, you have the proposed um, feeder network plan that is um, in conjunction with State Highway 119 BRT. 
So you can see there are a few uh, changes, um, mainly to the east and to the southwest. Um, in the east, uh, a route, fixed route out to the Walmart and the hospital, which I know is something that um, you know, people have been looking for, um, as well as the adjustments on the southwest part um, with the redevelopment of the mall. Um, and then um, also still considering the service out to the high school um, specifically for school trippers. Uh, again, this study was done and the, the, the adjustment was done with a lot of input from staff and from stakeholders. Uh, and it also took into consideration, obviously, where the stations for the 119 BRT network are to be. So um, we, we really uh, did an extensive uh, plan and, and took our time to, to get this right. Next slide. Making adjustments to the local network. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's always flexible. That's that's what it is. <laughs> so here you can just see uh, real quick the, the change in weekday platform hours um, from what it is current and what is proposed and what the difference in service hours is. So for weekday, it is basically an increase um, of about 20 percent. Um, and the same for Saturday, it's an increase of about 20 percent. And for Sunday, it's even as much as an increase of 40% of in-service hours. So um, almost a doubling of service of, of Sunday and a significant increase, um, a notable increase for the weekday and Saturday. And that is by taking some of the hours from current routings and shifting them around. Um, as you can see, there are more routes um, in the proposed than in the current. That means that we're looking to um, basically split routes because some routes like the 323 um, are, are, are almost two separate routes as they are. They have that southern western portion and then the north northeastern portion and the ridership is is quite different. And a lot of these folks, um, a lot of these customers transfer at currently 8th and Kaufman. And so by, by splitting the route and allowing the tail, so to say, to be more flexible, um, it allows us to adjust the network, um, have more frequency or different frequency on one section than on the other. And so again, coming back to phasing, the flexibility um, to move along as things become warranted, because we all know things can change. And as we've noted in the last year, can change in a heartbeat. <laughs> so that's all I have for now. We can most certainly go into more detail if you have questions afterwards. And I'm going to hand it off to Chris. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Chris Quinn with our with RTD with our RTD planning. Um, uh, a couple of things that I'm going to be talking about are the Northwest Rail and status of State Highway 119. Can you go to the next slide, Phil? So, as Director Geisinger and uh, uh, Director Davidson did note. On February 9th, we staff went to the board to provide an update on where we stand with Northwest Rail, giving the history, the status of where we are now, um, all of just kind of a how we got to where we are. And one of the things, and it, it, as I was going through the report, trying to come up with um, what to present tonight, it was it was came almost a little bit overwhelming. But a few things that I do want to emphasize in the next couple of slides uh, to show where we are are as follows. Just, I, I think most of you have been plugged into the process long enough to know that one of the biggest challenges that we have related to this corridor is the fact that, um, actually, can you go to the next slide, Phil? The Northwest Rail is the only one of the fast tracks corridors where RTD was not able to uh, either all out purchase or come up with a full uh, full on lease agreement for the right of way. So of all the rail corridors, uh, this one, we will have to have a unique arrangement with the BNSF. Currently, it's a single track corridor, meaning there's just one set of tracks out there. And if we were to establish the full service in the corridor, we would have to construct a full set of tracks parallel to the existing tracks. If we were to go with the, uh, the starter service, which Director Geisinger referenced earlier on, 
Uh, the intent of that is that we might be able to use, use the existing infrastructure with fewer improvements. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, just a moment. Um, but in order to have passenger service on the corridor, we would be sharing the, the corridor with freight service. Uh, BNSF intends to, uh, to keep their freight operations going. Right now, they have about eight to 10 trains a day, and they expect that number to either continue to be constant or go up in the future. Given the fact that we would be sharing operations with the freight services, we would have to have um, what is known as a Federal Railway Administration crash-worthy vehicle, meaning that it has to have extra protections more than the light rail that you see uh, in parts of Denver, uh, so that if a freight train were to derail and collide with one of our train, the passenger trains, that the, uh, there would be adequate protection for the passengers. Another unique thing about the corridor is even though the BNSF is currently running freight through there, there is no signalization uh, in railroad parlance that is it's dark territory, uh, meaning that the, the trains are dispatched in and out. Um, if we were to add passenger service in, we would have to uh, install signalization and we would also have to install what is known as positive train control. That's a new federal requirement um, that actually, for lack of a better way to describe it, it's almost um, if, as an example, if, a, if an operator were to go through a signal that they shouldn't be going through, uh, the positive train control would actually stop the train from going any further to, provo to, to prevent a collision. And then um, uh, we would add, obviously, and I think this was addressed in the Northwest uh, Environmental Evaluation that was completed in 2020, 2010, we would in fact have to establish quiet zones throughout the corridor. And that's, I think Boulder County has already started implementing some of those on their own, but uh, it, it we'd pretty much have to implement those on all of the crossings throughout the corridor. And I think there's approximately 40 uh, between Westminster and Longmont. Uh, next slide, Phil. Hey, Chris, we uh, we have a Chrissy grant for that. So $4 million from the oh. federal government, $4 million from the city. So we're working on that. So we'll just uh, ask for our money back, I guess, at some point. You're, you're ahead of us. <laughs> it's good to, I forgot. I had forgotten that. So, so yeah, thanks for uh, reminding me on that. Sure. And, uh, and just a few things on the full Northwest service. Um, initially, the intent of the Northwest uh, Rail as part of the Fast Tracks plan was that it would run from uh, Union Station to Longmont. And currently, the only piece of that ha that has been constructed is the segment to Westminster Station. So there still is about 38 miles to construct um, to, to complete the corridor all the way to Longmont. The initial uh, service envisioned 55 trains per day and uh, with bi-directional service running at 30 minute peak uh, or 30 minute rush hour uh, frequencies and one hour in non-rush hour. Uh, as I said earlier, that would assume a double track. So a new set of tracks being laid out throughout the corridor as well as FRA compliant vehicles and a new maintenance facility for those vehicles. Uh, next slide, Phil. Whereas the uh, peak period service or the starter service, which was uh, considered just have started uh, a few years ago, we started the analysis of that. So in working with the stakeholders, uh, we came up with a possible plan there. And the intent was to significantly reduce the capital costs by using the, the existing infrastructure that's out there right now. So in this case, could we get by with a just the, the single track configuration that's out there right now? And if that's the case, uh, we would we realize all we would need would be uh, passing tracks or what the railroads refer to as uh, uh, sidings, so that if there were a freight train in the corridor, the freight train could park on the siding or the passing track while the passenger service went through. The cost for that uh, we had uh, estimated to be about 708 million, but as Director Davidson emphasized, we wanted to keep the cost as conservative as possible, especially as it related to the acquisition of right-of-way. So 
uh, it's certainly a number that needs more refinement. And next slide, Phil. Then also, as Director Geisinger um, mentioned at the beginning, there are some parallel efforts that are going on at the same time that this is going on. Uh, specifically, the state formed in 2017 the Southwest Chief uh, Passenger Rail Commission. And with that uh, was the establishment of the Front Range Passenger Rail Study, which identified uh, potential corridors along the Front Range. Um, one of those corridors would run from Fort Collins to Pueblo, and one of the alignments in that would, uh, would in fact, use the Northwest Rail. Um, so that's one of the considerations, one of the alternatives that's under consideration. Let's see. And next slide, Phil. And then along with that, also Amtrak has, uh, as part of their modernization effort, they're looking at corridors of approximately 400 miles or less uh, in between major population centers. Uh, what they're really trying to focus on is areas that where flights, air service doesn't really work, but would be right for uh, passenger rail. And one of the corridors under consideration would be the Fort Collins to Pueblo, Fort Collins to Colorado Springs. The way the federal reauthorization of uh, transportation funds works, the corridors that are chosen, they could have up to 100% of the capital costs covered, and then uh, the initial first five years of operating costs could be covered as well. So it's certainly something, you know, we're trying to position our, working in a way so that we can position ourselves so that if something comes up with either the state or with Amtrak, we are ready to go. And as both directors, Guy Singer and Davidson did say, after the February 9th meeting, we did commit to coming back to the board with a uh, with a path forward, uh, or actually a couple of alternatives to present to the board on paths forward for their consideration on how we might uh, uh, to have reconsider the service on the Northwest. So. I will leave it at that, and then I think the next slides are related to a State Highway 1. Oh, excuse me, before that, the uh, first in Main station update. Okay, next slide, Phil. So I'm not sure how much the uh, advisory board has been apprised uh, of this. Um, it previously, as part of Fast Tracks, um, $17 million was set aside for the Longmont, downtown Longmont station. So we have been working closely with the city on coming up with what is called an infrastructure master plan or an IMP, trying to determine, given some of the unique challenges to that particular site, how could we foster a, a plan that would accommodate both new mixed uses that the city would like to see on the site, as well as satisfy the needs of RTD for a future rail station and a multimodal, multimodal facility where uh, we could also focus bus operations for the State Highway 119 uh, future bus rapid transit service. So we've been working with the city on that analysis that um, has been mostly completed and it included uh, the slideshows, boundary survey, drainage analysis, and that sort of stuff, uh, as well as a phasing concept. So now that that's been mostly completed, my understanding is, and I haven't worked on this, my understanding is that it's um, substantially complete and at this point just addressing comments in the from the final plan. Um, right, Chris, I can chime in real quick because yeah. staff met today. So um, we, we, the city staff did review um, the document and did give uh, comments and feedback and now RTD staff um, engineering is and service planning and, and systems planning is reviewing it. And uh, we will, once we have all our comments combined, send it back to the city. There will be a few items we will have to talk over and clarify, but um, the IMP is moving forward steadily. Good. Okay. And I don't know, Phil, if there's anything else you would like to add onto that as well, since I know you've been uh, fairly, you and Tony have been uh, pretty deep involved with that. Yeah, I mean, I can add a couple of things. It's just that the city uh, did go through and review that piece. And now we do need to get to the kind of the nitty gritty and what's, you know, who who does what, when. 
those kind of things. And that's going to get into an intergovernmental agreement between RTD and the city of Longmont. So that'll be kind of that next step. And then at that point, we're hoping, hoping that we can go forward with uh, property acquisitions and start drawing against the $17 million that set aside, well, uh, $17 million that was set aside by RTD for this project. And that's kind of that next step. Okay, thanks. Okay, and then uh, the next slide is uh, related to State Highway 119. So I, I, I know we were, we addressed the advisory board about a year ago, and at that time we had completed the uh, State Highway 119 PEL or the Planning and Environmental Linkage Study. Um, and at that time, uh, the recommendation coming out of the PEL was for a bus rapid transit similar to what's going, what was, what, similar to what's out there on US 36, so that there would be a managed lane in the center. That lane would be for buses, tolls, and uh, high occupancy vehicle users. Um, so, we, and with that, uh, the next steps that have happened since the completion of that study is CDOT is now moving forward with a an operational study to an operational analysis, I should say, to determine exactly how the managed lanes would function on State Highway 119. Uh, unlike US 36, 119, at least the Longmont diagonal piece of it, has uh, signalized intersections, and there isn't anywhere in the US or North America that we know of where there have been managed managed toll lanes. Uh, with grade separate or with um, a signalized intersections. So they're currently conducting an operational analysis to determine how it would work. They have a consultant apex uh, on board. And I think that effort's supposed to be completed in the next couple of months. When they finish that, they're going to begin what is known as a traffic and revenue study then to determine what kind of tolling rates uh, they could establish on the corridor with, and that'll determine then how much money the corridor can raise from tolls, which can determine then how much money they can uh, leverage uh, on future tolls as far as uh, you know, determining financing, me financing mechanisms for construction of the corridor. Uh, the other thing then, and this is really the big piece, is they have also engaged uh, Mueller Engineering to come up to begin the engineering design on the corridor. So um when the design begins then we'll start to know exactly what the configuration of the lanes will be they will also be working on the design of the brt stations as well so that we'll really get a better sense of how the corridor is going to function right now rtd as part of our uh, mid-term financial plan we have 30 million dollars designated for 2023 that will go to the corridor and we've also put in a request as part of the uh, consideration for this next year's midterm financial plan to accelerate 5 million of those dollars so that we can uh, kind of move forward a little bit faster on some of the design issues so that if with the new administration, there are, if there are some federal funding that becomes available, uh, we're more ready to go and uh, can, you know, jump into this a little bit faster. So, and I think, what do I, have? I can't remember if I have any more slides on that, Phil. Oh, and just as a, I threw this in there just to show, if any of you were around when US 36 was being put together, the the total cost for the corridor was way more than any one of, and any, was more than any one of the agencies or entities had. Um, and in this case, the total cost we're thinking for the corridor is, I want to say 200 and, I'm forgetting the number now, 200 and maybe 70 million. And we, so far, we've really only been able to identify 93 million. But using the model of US 36, at the beginning, we didn't have enough money, but uh, RTD was able to come to the, uh, the table with 300 million from Fast Tracks. Then we were able to get a, uh, we were able to get a loan. I think we even got an earmark. Um, CDOT was then able to come to the table with more money. And the point being, 
money kind of brings in money. So the more money you have, the more money you can leverage from future grants. So our hope is at least having money that has been identified, we can use that to as part of our local match for future grants uh, as, as we move forward. And I think that's it for a 119. So. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think that's the uh, presentation from RTD. Really appreciate yeah. your time. Good, good job, Chris, on mm -hmm. handling kind of a interesting situation there. It looked like so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. way, to, way to be mobile and, and flexible. Um, are there any questions from our TAB members to any of the uh, different slides on this, or to any of the um, directors that uh, to D Director Davidson or Director Geisinger? And I'll let Jock uh, kind of take care of that. All right, thanks. Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I can't see folks. So if you're raising your hand, I can't see you. So just, <laughs> just jump right in there. Thank you, Phil. Uh, any questions for our guests? Uh, David. Uh, for Well, one thing I hadn't realized, I guess, during the previous presentations about the uh, uh the diagonal bus rapid transit that we were looking at making that a tollway so that, that i i guess maybe i had just missed that before so um is, is that a new development uh that that's one question and the other one is is that uh, you'd mentioned that you kind of anticipated possible passenger rail at 55 trains a day and freight at eight trains a day which might go up um and then you mentioned that the freight is likely to move over when the train when the passenger trains go by, and I thought I couldn't see that happening. With fifty five trains, they never make it. They never make it. And uh, yeah, so I'm uh, kind of curious as to what what you really think is going to happen. Yeah, let me answer the second question first. Uh, so related to the trains, so in the scenario with the fifty five trains per day that would in fact require a full double tracking of the system. So we would have to add a complete new set of tracks parallel to the existing tracks throughout the entire corridor, or as you point out, there's just no way that that can possibly work unless all of the freight trains were to go through the corridor between like two and 4 a.m., which, you know, BNSF is not going to let happen. Um, with the starter service, with the proposal of the three trains, in in the morning that would be, originate in Longmont and then head down the corridor south to Denver. So just one way in the morning into Denver and then the reverse in the afternoon. That's where we would employ the uh, passing tracks to allow for the mixing of the operations on the single track operation. But even that, um, and I, I'm trying to remember, uh, BNSF did come up with some plans for us on what that could look like in terms of um, where the passing tracks would have to be and i'm trying to remember the number whether it was there was at least three or five and each one of those passing tracks has to be more than a mile long given the length of the of the uh the freight trains that go through there so while it's significantly less investment than double tracking the entire corridor there is still some work that would go into it so we're not just you know plopping down trains into what's out there right now with no upgrades so and your first question, I believe, was on the, the tolling for State Highway 119? That's right. Yeah. So the final recommendation that came out of the study was for a managed lane. Um, and that's what and that is, in fact, what we had taken out to the public um, it, with the intent of it functioning similar to the way US 36 operates. So free to buses, free to carpools, but any uh, anyone else in a a single occupant car or two occupant car would have to pay the toll to use the facility. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the board? Um, I was gonna ask a quick question, Chris, since we're on the topic yeah. of rail. I was reading an article in the New York Times this weekend <laughs> And it said something interesting, and I was just curious if you knew. This is this has to do with Amtrak, so you may or may not know the answer. But they cited that Amtrak actually had priority on a rail line. Is that true? Does, does freight have to? I, I read that article, and 
and, and I'm not going to try to venture into the legal aspects of that, but my understanding is, and so and we'll get back to you to make sure that whatever I say tonight is actually correct. But my understanding of that is theoretically they have priority, but they have to be able to keep the freight operations whole. And so what often happens is the freight still, in reality, the freight still has priority often over the passenger services. So now in the case of, say, the Northeast Corridor, all of that uh, if between Boston and Washington, D.C., all of that operates on its own track. Uh, and there's segments and other segments of the Northeast where that's also the case where and some of the busier corridors on other corridors. Um, and I remember experiencing this in Western Massachusetts several years ago. Um, you know, all of a sudden the Amtrak train comes to a halt. The conductor gets on, announces they're waiting for a freight train to get through. So I, my understanding is that, yeah, they have priority, but it doesn't work that way. But we can come up, uh, I'll, we'll get back to you with a more uh, refined answer than my anecdotal uh, Western Massachusetts experience. <laughs> oh, and, and uh, yeah, just so you know, that's my anecdotal as well as Worcester to Boston. Uh, yeah, to yeah. Back exactly. and forth all the time. <laughs> so I, I remember giving way to yeah. the freight trains as yeah. we were venturing into the city. Uh, okay, thanks, Chris. Uh, the other questions I had, well, first one's a comment. I just wanted to give some kudos to the Flex Ride. I know it's kind of a relatively new service, um i've you know personally experienced the flex ride i think it's a great service for longmont um it's good to see the data that was presented tonight so thank you for that and then on the local rides i was curious i i just keep coming back to the same question every time i see the local data which is do we know who's riding do we have demographic data have we done a survey uh I just, I feel like I need to know who's using the service so that I can better understand how it's being used in the expansion and all this. Sure, thanks for asking the question. Um, the last survey we did uh, specifically for the North area, um, pre-COVID, we were on a three-year cycle between the various teams. Um, so the last one we did was in 2017, so we were due. Um, last year. Um, I know that RTD internally is working on a customer service uh, survey, um, onboard survey, so we will gather more recent data um, in that regard. Um, we do have data, I know, from another customer service that was done region-wide in 2015. So, is 2015 still the same as today? Maybe, maybe not. But um, we'd be more than happy to share that data with you when, when the, this next survey is done. I'll make sure that um, Jeff uh, Tengrish is aware of that. And as soon as we have that available, we'll, we'll be happy to share it. That would be great. I look forward to it once we can right. get back to some and sense I, of normalcy. I appreciate the, the, the concern. I understand um, ridership, um, the demographics in Lamont are different. Um, specifically than many other areas within the metro region, um, concentration-wise. So uh, we're well aware of that, and we're keeping a close eye on that as well. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we did with the local network plan what we did to allow for as much flexibility as possible um, to address changes in demographics and socioeconomic uh, changes, et cetera as best as possible. Thank you, thank you, Natalie, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, given the growth up here, I would be highly surprised if we're not a lot different from 2019. Just, it seems like every three months, things are changing up here in Longmont. We're growing by leaps and bounds. All right, any other questions from the group? Uh, Joan Peck, council member Joan Peck. Thank you. Um, I want to thank all the directors as well as the RTD staff. This was a great presentation uh, and all your hard work. It's, it's really showing. Um, Chris, I, I was wondering if this presentation, uh, are we going to give incremental updates to the public? I know we had the transportation conversation, but um, keeping the public informed as to our progress, what we're doing and where we're going. Um, do you have any of those? 
planned for the general public? I, I don't have a good answer for you right now, but as um, as we did note earlier, uh, we will be going to the board sometime probably in April to determine uh, what path we want to take forward. So with that, and I'm kind of speaking a little bit prematurely, but I think what we're going to go is presenting probably like three options to the board uh, based on, you know, effort, cost, et cetera. So within those varying tiers, there's probably going to be different levels of public engagement that would be associated with it. So um, I can't answer that now, but we'll probably have a better sense of um, what that will be in a little more than a month or so. Okay, great. Thanks. I look forward yeah. to it. All right. Yeah, I want to echo that. Thank you so much for for coming and presenting. Uh, I, this is one of my annual days that I always look forward to. <laughs> I love seeing the new data and seeing where we are and where we're going. So, oh, look at that. Joan Peck has even got the applause going there. <laughs> and we appreciate it as well. We appreciate that we can um, come and share this information with you. That's uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so moving on to the next item here, I see EV station 2020 summary and rate analysis. Uh, yeah, Jock, thank you. Um, Tim Ellis is going to join us. It looks like he's uh, joining us again as host. So what we're going to we're going to go with it and. Tim has some good information to share with this group. So um, he's our renewable energy strategy manager. So thanks for joining us tonight, Tim, and floor is yours. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, board members, for um, allowing me to present tonight. Um, I am the renewable energy strategy manager at Longmont Power Communications. And tonight I'm going to be presenting. Um, I guess I'll share my screen. I'll be do doing the presenting. Um, so I will do that right now. Sorry for the delay. Can everyone see that screen, the presentation? I can see it. I think you're good. Excellent. Yep. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, my name is Tim Ellis. Tonight I'm going to be presenting on the um, 2020 summary of our publicly owned, our city owned EV charging stations and also talking about our, our upcoming rate determinations. Um, so you, as you know, electric vehicles and the electric vehicle station plans are, are an important piece of the city's overall transportation plan. Uh, the sustainability plan includes it to reduce harmful air, air emissions. The climate action plan has EV discussions and strategies to reduce greenhouse gases. And our public and fleet electric vehicle education and support, as well as increasing uh, electric uh, charging infrastructure, are also embedded in our new plans, the uh, carbon free um, equitable transportation roadmap. Um, all of these include uh, discussions and strategies around EVs. And um, as you can see from this map, we do now have five electric vehicle stations available to the public. Um, they are located north to south um, in the city at the memorial at the SC um, between Maine and Kimbark uh, in the garage at the library. That one was installed just last year. And we also have one down at the museum and one at the service center. So, in summary of some of the data that we collect, all of our, our stations are now charge point. We switched them over uh, in 2019. The four original ones and the lot one we installed at the library last year is also a charge point. Charge point allows us to get a lot of different kinds of data. So, we monitor and track uh, different pieces of data that we, we use to, to see how the stations are being used and at what rates and, and things like that, as I'll present tonight. Uh, the first piece of data for 2020. We had uh, over 40,000 kilowatt hours of use at our all five stations. And this, this uh, is associated with some greenhouse gas savings uh, when, we, when ChargePoint actually put these numbers together to compare if someone had driven um, um, a certain amount of miles with a car and, char and, and ran on gas versus running on electricity. 
uh, the calculated savings was over 17 metric tons of carbon dioxide for 2020. And this graphic kind of shows just a basic comparison between a standard vehicle, in this case, it's a, a Subaru Outback, and a, a standard electric vehicle like the Nissan Leaf. And uh, the two important uh, circled points here are buying a, buying and driving on one gallon of gas. Um, if you do the equivalent amount in um, a, a, for the equivalent cost in electric, you get over 90 miles of, of extra driving uh, mileage. Um, you also save a significant amount of money over the year. This is if you drive over 12,000 miles per year, um, a typical electric driver will see over $1,000 in savings versus uh, the same amount of driving in, 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 a, in a gas car. Um, and this graphic just lays out month to month the number of sessions. And a session is each time a vehicle plugs into a station. So we had almost 4,000 sessions in 2020. And here are the number of unique drivers. And this is a breakdown by each station of how many unique and individual people actually uh, access to the driver. So the, the same driver can go to the station multiple times, but, that, but this is not that number. This is actually each unique person that has uh, plugged into our stations throughout the city. Um, and the total comes to about the 342 uh, that had used it in 2020. You can see here that the library only had 13, but that was because we just um, got the library station online in September of 2020. So it only had a, a few months to get up and running and, and get people uh, accessing it. <clears throat> and this table shows kind of a breakdown of, of, of different types of data that we're tracking uh, for each station. Uh, the first column is the available hours. Uh, that is, you know, each station has two ports, and obviously there are, are 80,760 8, hours per year. So with this number, we're just we're just uh, adding up all the available uh, hours that each port or, and station are available. So, for instance, service center was available all year round uh, last year, and both parts ports were available. So the total was 17,000 and. 520 hours, whereas the museum was down for repairs at the end of the year last year, so it had a little less. And as I said in the previous slide, the library just got online in September, so it only had a little over 4,000 available hours. Um, this is number is important when we look at the next two, uh, which are charging time and the time at station. The charging time is how, how many hours during the year that a car was actually charging off the station. And the time of the, at the station was how long they were plugged in. So we expect there to be more time plugged in than actual charging. But as we can see in the last column, which is charged in while plugged in, I know it gets a little, we're all over the place, but uh, the last column really shows that, you know, customers who came in to charge generally charged, they, they, they might've been there a little longer than they were charging, but they generally got off um, soon after they finished charging their car. So you can see the numbers in the high 70s and, and 80% where that's how long the car was actually charging while it was plugged into the station. And that's an important number for us to keep an eye on because we don't want people plugging in and leaving for the day and then taking up that spot and not allowing other electric vehicles potentially to come in and charge at that same port. Um, at the time, charging versus available hours is an important one to so we can see uh, how long, uh, per, how much each day that our car that cars were actually plugged in and charging at our stations to see how they were utilized. And uh, it's, it's those numbers vary quite a bit, um, but we can see at the Memorial and DSC stations that 16 and 20 percent is a pretty high number because we're considering the available hours is 24 hours a day. So if someone, a vehicle is there 20% of the time, that's actually very high for an electric vehicle charging amount uh, versus available hours. And next, um, so, so the stations were changed out to charge point in 2019. And like I said, last year, we put the library station in. So customers and our, you know, people who come into the city and live in the city, have had free charging for those stations for the past almost two years now. Prior to that, we had uh, um, another vendor uh, had the stations at those four initial locations and, and we charged a dollar an hour during that time period. But after we changed them out, 
Um, we wanted folks to get, you know, reassociated with with uh, the new stations and, and find where they are. We put some information up on the web uh, where our stations were. So we wanted to get people reengaged with the stations. And we feel that it's been enough time so folks know where they are and uh, and how to use the new charge point stations. So at this time, we felt it was appropriate to start charging um, folks who are coming to use those stations because, you know, they do cost money, they do use electricity. So some of the things we used to calculate the rate that we anticipate having are the cost of electricity, uh, average, average hours of charging so that we can recoup the costs of depending on how long the, the, um, the vehicle is charging, um, purchase and installation of the stations, um, station maintenance and repair. We have five year maintenance and repair contracts for all the stations. And there are certain wiring metering costs as well as administration. Uh, but we also deducted from that total amount of, of funds that we, we use to operate and purchase the stations. We had a rebate from uh, the state of Colorado, which was very substantial. So we actually took that rebate out of the total cost and we ended up coming up with about a dollar an hour as an appropriate charge, um, which is what we charged previously and what our nearby cities, Boulder, Loveland, and Fort Collins are all charging a dollar an hour. It's a pretty standard rate for EV charging stations and our, all the costs added up and, and uh, you know, appropriated. Um, we came out just about that. So, so we would be able to recoup our costs for that uh, rate. And just a bigger picture slide here. Um, you know, the graph on the right is from the Colorado EV plan for 2020. And they hit the, it charts three different uh, scenarios for EV purchases over the next uh, 10 years or so. <clears throat> the, that uh, first one, the, the orange one, the lowest one is business as usual. The second, the middle one is the actual plan that Colorado has come up with. And then there's a high scenario to that plan. But in either case, um, we're really looking at a tremendous expectation for, for vehicles in Colorado, electric vehicles up to upwards of you know, three quarters of a million to over a million potentially. And, uh, and there was an interesting quote from a study that Rocky Mountain Institute did that if we electrify all of our, our light duty vehicles in the US, that that would increase electricity demand by about 25%. So, so it's no, it's a, quite a substantial, um, you know, impact on, on our roads, on our, you know, on our electric grid, on our air emissions. So there's, there's significant impacts with all the expectations that were, that, that have been thought to, that are going to occur over the next uh, 10 years. So it's something substantial that we really need to consider. And the next steps for, for just this presentation are we're going to uh, present to the Sustainability Board uh, on the 17th, next Wednesday. We are presenting to City Council on the 30th. Um, following Council approval of, of that new rate, <clears throat> we're going to be educating the community about implementing the rate um, over the next few months. And then this summer, we intend to actually start charging customers uh, that dollar per hour at the stations. That's pretty much all I have. Any questions? Uh, David, I see your hand raised there. Um, I think I might have saw something in the presentation in our packet talking about expanding the locations of the stations, or may maybe I misread that. But are there, right. did you discuss that, or do you have? anything planned that, that you can talk about well no at this time that's true we there we are what we're doing is we're monitoring the usage and we're kind of looking at how the market's going to unfold so we want to encourage ev use and we want to make the infrastructure available but the the market is changing so dynamically right now whether it's the public entities cities that are going to install stations or the private, private businesses uh, it's still kind of up in the air where who's going to drive that market in the future and uh, Colorado, the state of Colorado is doing a lot of effort and putting a lot of money into building, you know, highways of, of electric uh, charging stations across the major routes in Colorado. So, so we're kind of keeping our eye on it, but we're, we're looking to where it would make the most sense for, for Longmont and we want to do it in a smart way. So we're kind of waiting to see where a good place would be, and then we'll study it and we'll we'll put ones out there that we think are are the best uh, you know solution for for our for our residents. 
Um, but we don't have any plans for the next one direct, like specifically, but we are, it, it is in the plans. We want to put more in. We just want to do it in the, in the most um, intelligent, strategic way possible. Okay. Thank you. I uh, see Sandra's hand raised. And if you're so, raising your hand and I can't see you, just tell me. <laughs> thank you. So, so tell me, how would you pay if you were charging your electric vehicle? How, do you pay by credit card? Is that like you would at a gas station or how will the city get the money? Yeah, and that's one of the great things about ChargePoint. They have a whole mechanism um, to charge. They what you do when you you have an iPhone and you sign up on ChargePoint and you have to put a credit card in no matter what. Even if we're if it's free, you still put a credit card into ChargePoint. But they send you a, a barcode. You scan it right on the on the station, and it charges the card. Then ChargePoint will collect that money for us and send us a check every month. Okay. Thank you. Jack, this is Joe Long. Thanks, Joe. A question that keeps bouncing around in my mind as we're driving or our goals are to pretty significantly increase EV utilization. And I start looking then at concurrent use. And although we've got these linear measurements of available hours, we are still faced with a pretty big challenge of concurrent use. So seven people show up to charge the vehicle. Is the fee that we're proposing to charge include an allowance for expansion? In other words, is there some kind of profitability or is that just a cost covering fee? Well, now it's a, that's a, it's a great question because um, we want to be able to recoup our costs, the costs that we've already put in and the ongoing costs. But as there is more usage, the, the cost is based on, available, on, on actual charging times because it's a dollar an hour. So the more customers that actually utilize those stations, the more revenue is going to be brought in. So that kind of, as the market goes up and as more people purchase in state, uh, EVs and use the stations, the collected revenue from the stations will go up, allowing us to expand. So there is kind of a built-in allowance to expand out as more uh, vehicles are using our stations, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Great. Thank you. Uh, Liz, did you have a question? I do. Um, the question I have is, as we begin charging for the electricity, is there any conversation about moving what had been paid for by the gas tax to these electric vehicles? You mean for road upkeep and that type of thing? Exactly. Yeah, we haven't really explored that yet. That's a, a federal and state issue mostly, but I, I, obviously we have to deal with it on a local basis, but we have not included that in our, our cost analysis at this time. You know, we only have the five stations up. And again, I think it, it, it greatly depends on how that market ends up being driven. If it becomes a, a commercial marketplace or is it more of a public marketplace? Um, so it's, a lot to be determined on that front, but that's an that's an excellent question. That's something that we're going to have to figure out um, as as more gas cars are replaced and that tax decreases. We're going to be short of funding for for needed transportation upgrades and and maintenance and repair. Yeah, for sure. But no, that's not in this current number. Great question. Yeah, I was actually in the state of Oregon when they were going through that about four or five years ago. Uh, they had such a high percentage of electric vehicles, they started looking at a tax based on number of miles per year rather than uh, the gas tax. So that's how, that's how they solved it. Any other questions? Um, I just had one, Tim. Uh, thanks for a great presentation there. I, I noticed some new EVs going in at the Walmart up on Main Street. And I was just wondering, is that city or is that private? That's private. And then that's, you know, that's part of the issue. Let me see if I can stop sharing. That's part of the issue is uh, figuring out where these stations and who is going to be put them in. But those are private stations um, and there's more and more going in all, all the time. And they have really interesting, I've been looking at some of the ways that they pay for their own stations. A lot of these big box real t retailers or other grocery stores, use reward points. You know, if you have reward points, you can plug in at the store and get your car charged for free. So there's all sorts of interesting incentives and and cost recovery out there that's still in the very nascent stages of this market. So 
So yeah, so those are those are pub, private, but um, and that's why we got to be careful where we put them because we don't want to put pay all the money and put them down and and not have folks use them. Yeah, and the other question I was going to think of is since we're using public funds, then we have to be careful not to undercut private because you you you, you can't uh, you can't basically use public funds to undercut competition in the, from the private right. sector. Exactly. We don't want to compete. If that's going to be happening in the market, regardless of what we do, we want to encourage that. Right? So, um, so that's why we also have to be careful. Yeah, very good. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you hanging in there. All right. Great. Yeah. Thanks for letting me host the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everybody. Take care. Right, I'll get off now Jim. so I won't host anymore. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, next item up is comments from board members. And so I'll just go in the order on my screen here. So Liz, you're at the top of my screen here. Just thanks to everyone. I really enjoyed the information, um, especially to the cooperation between the city and RTD as they thought carefully about where routes need to go in the future. I thought it was clear good thought had gone into that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Joe. How about you go next here? Sure. Yeah, I honestly, I was left with a lot of questions after seeing the RTD, RTD data. And honestly, probably want to spend some more time with others to see ultimately how some of these routing recommendations are made when you see some of the trending um, of utilization pre-COVID uh, relative to Longmont population growth. The numbers don't seem to be correlating. Um, so that's, that's part of where my questions are stemming. That makes sense. Yes, it sure does. <laughs> yes. And hopefully we will get some demographic data later this, this year, at least on the local routes. Uh, Sandra, I have you next up here. Well, I too have questions about RTD and the routing. Um, and so I'm interested in having more information on that. I want to make sure that the people that rely on RTD are getting the best service possible and um, getting where they need to get. But I question when the bus starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and ends at 6, if you've got a job that's late at night or, you know, you can get to work, but you can't get home. So I, I have questions about that. And I really appreciate um, the information about the EV stations because really I know nothing about electric cars, but I do know that we need to be working towards that. So um, I, I thought I heard in the state that they were over the next five years, we were supposed to have, it seems like hundreds of um, stations added along different routes. So I know that's coming and uh, I need to know more about it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like we need to get some more wind farms going here, right? 25% more electricity. <laughs> uh, Courtney, I have you next up here. All right. Um, uh, as you said as well, I think I look forward to the RTD presentation. Uh, since we had it last year, that was uh, the last meeting I think we had in person. So before COVID hit. So uh, I appreciate RTD coming up. You know, they came up in person last year and presenting everything and looking at the routes uh, and adjusting them as needed. But uh, Sandra, you have a very good point as to those hours that are available. Um, you know, a lot of people don't work a regular eight to five type of job, especially ones who need the bus. So um, that'd be interesting to see the demographics and if we could tie that to workplaces and uh, job status and that kind of thing, that would be very interesting to see if they can provide that to us. Thank you. Uh, David. Uh, yes, I, I'm also, I was also happy with the RTD presentation in that uh, I know it, it felt there was um, uh, some flexibility in the routing um, that I hadn't seen in the past. And, uh, you know, I haven't been on the board that long, but it just looked, it was, uh, it was uh, refreshing to see that changes were being considered um, 
and that uh, the Longmont board that was helping to determine what those routes were sound like, at least based on what they had said, that they were being listened to. So uh, I found that very encouraging. Um, I'm also very much in favor of the EV. We, we've had an electric car now for just over a year, and we got to fight each other in the family to see who gets to drive it. It's just, it's marvelous. So I would recommend it to anybody. <laughs> That's all I have. All right. Thanks, David. Um, I, I uh, you know, I look around Longmont and I just see an incredible city being grown here from the new hospital to the parking garage, to the rapid transit, to Boulder, to the EVs. This place is happening. And, you know, I just, uh, I'm very grateful for our city staff who work so hard to try to watch all this stuff. And um, yeah, I just, I, I'm very, just very happy to live here. And um, yeah, I, I guess I'll just leave it at that, so. <laughs> all right, I didn't miss anyone except for council member Peck, correct? Okay, people moved around on my screen. So now they're out of order and I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> All right, thanks, thanks, member Pat. thanks Jock. Um, I wanna echo what you said about our staff and especially give kudos to uh, Phil Greenwald for our local routes. He works very hard on them and he works very, very well with RDD. Um, it has a great network connection there. Um, I would like, I remember when RTD first came to the council meeting in that. Uh, the new director mentioned that in these local routes that we should may have smaller buses rather than the big ones. So I I am curious as to where that conversation is going to go in the future. Right now, I'm sure there's no capital money for that, but um, I think that would help us a lot on our local routes. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, okay, short. Sure. Uh, let's see, I guess next up here, info on upcoming transportation related meetings. Do we have anything? We do. We have a, a meeting that's coming up sponsored, excuse me, sponsored by the Northwest Chamber Alliance for the 11th and I believe four o'clock. So we'll send you out the information. It's it's kind of late coming to us, quite frankly, but we're excited to get the information out to you. It's a, it's basically representative Jonah, Jonah Goose with a listening session, as well as a number of state senators and uh, state representatives talking about the different levels of the transportation need and the transportation funding that's coming forward, both through the U.S. Congress and the state, uh, the state representative and the state legislature. So. Uh, that'll be an interesting session, and I'll send that to you as soon as we're out of this meeting. I'll send you the pamphlet from the Northwest Chamber, and I think you can just log on. It's It, it should be fairly straightforward. Excellent. Yeah, especially given all the irons we have in the fire right now. It'll be uh, good to hear what's, what's coming out there. Uh, okay, let's see. Next up here, I guess, items for upcoming agenda. It looks like we have the tip, the... Project status updates on the transportation improvement program. Anything else, uh, Tyler and Phil, want to add? Yeah, the other one looks like we have on there for next will oh. be some information on transportation and community investment fees. So um, we'll have some information to share about that at our next meeting as well. Thank you. It helps if I turn the page over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 730, I think I will give you 30 minutes back here. So unless there's anything else, I think we can adjourn. All right, thank you very much. Have, have a great, great day. day. Stacy. Thanks, Phil. Sorry about the issues up front, but we got got through them. That's okay. If I need your help, you know I put it in the notes. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. All right, have a good evening. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.
Hm? Sogar zwei Männer 